Okay, folks, we're, we're getting down the home stretch here. So we're going to, well, first I have an announcement. I want to remind everyone that, uh, any of the presenters, that um, if we haven't heard otherwise from you, the slides that you loaded here are going to go up on the website associated with the meeting. So please, if you object to that, make sure you talk to these two, or uh, one of them, um, before the end of the meeting. And meanwhile, if you want to change any of your slides, please come and talk to them so we could do that. So that's the one logistical thing. Um, we're going to change the schedule slightly. We're going to still definitely end at 4. But I'm going to have this open discussion now around um, several topics, which I'll get to in a second. And then rather than turn it over to Kathy and Rick and then to Francis, we're going to actually have Francis go immediately after me in wrap-up mode um, and then turn it over to Kathy and to Rick for sort of the next steps discussion. And then when they're done, uh, Francis will sort of take any last questions or any sort of last comments that he may have as well. So that's the plan. So we received um, both uh, from emails we got from you from remote folks and from ideas that sort of bubbled up in the discussion, oh, there was probably a good 20 to 30 possible parking lot type topics, things that either didn't get touched on at all or just barely got prodded but really didn't have any time to discuss it. Um, it was impossible. We could have been here till 9 o'clock tonight if we were going to try to do all of them. It's not what any of us want to do. And so we, a small group of us caucused over lunch and we just picked four topics which are up there on that easel that are just sort of four we're going to touch base on now something like for the next hour or so maybe we'll spend 10 to 15 minutes on each and we're going to do it in the order so you can start thinking about it one is something again we've touched on but i don't think we've really had a serious conversation about and that's health disparities second which we did hear a little bit of a comment just a second ago about the uk biobank pediatrics um, third is the sort of forming the question of do we need a law or laws to prevent misuse um, and fourth, uh, related to cohort retention. Um, how do we deal with, uh, if, if we bring in especially major providers involved in this, how do we keep them retained over a long haul? And then the flip side of it is, how do we keep, we did touch on this a little, we want to talk more, how do we keep participants interested in, in, in keeping them retained in, in, in such of a, a long-term cohort and ever? So those are sort of the first time. We're going to do this in order. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of other topics one could imagine, we just don't have time for it. So let's start with health disparities. And what we would really love to hear people's either questions or more importantly their comments or their thoughts about a whole range of topics that would, would fall under the category that could be of concern. Certainly we've heard a lot about this from people, concerns about how do we make sure this properly gives us an opportunity to study and appreciate and try to understand uh, health disparities. So, I saw Mike and then... And then so very quickly, one, one thing to consider are uh, geospatial variables. If you know the address of a subject, this is something we did when we were at Cleveland Clinic. If you know somebody's address, you can learn an awful lot about them and uh, do, some, do some rich work. So that, and, and that would address an issue around how to make sure you understood something about the individuals. I got another issue, that, of course, that comes up is how do we make sure that we're recruiting into, in, in certain areas that otherwise maybe is being completely missed. So we'll go Mark and then I think Gonzalo. Yeah, this is just a follow-up to the mic. I think we need to think about geographic disparity. Uh, we have seen several maps that show what I might characterize as the coastal rind of research um, uh, for with the, if you include the Great Lakes as part of the, uh, uh, the, the, the water that surrounds this country. We have huge deserts um, uh, within the central parts of the state of the United States that are really not captured and it's very difficult to, you know, uh, compete in those areas. So that's something that should be considered in the mix of all disparities. Gonzalo? Yeah, so I completely second Mark's comment. You know, in the, in the map that Mike Lauer put yesterday, there were many southern states and many mountain states that were empty. But, uh, you know, the other thing that's pretty shocking when you, when you look at the numbers, even though there were hundreds of thousands of minority samples, it was out of 17 million. And I think, you know, we really have to reflect the population of the U.S. The health problems will be different in different subsets of that population. I think a goal should be that this should be representative of all the different people in the U.S. and all, all their different concerns. Yeah. Dan? Ooh, lots of hands. Okay. Yeah, so, so one of the, the common um, wisdom things is that um, 
low SES or minority populations don't have access to information technology or don't, or don't use the, the digital divide that was prominently featured about 10 years ago. And, and, and I w what I would say is from the perspective of um, chairing the biomedical computing and health informatics study section, uh, which receives lots of applications about um, things like M Health, and there, there's a pretty good growing body of evidence that there are methodologies to overcome these, that it is not an unstoppable problem to um, have use by minorities of things like uh, M Health devices and smart watches, and, and we even heard today vendors might be willing to to uh, supplement or provide uh, support for those kinds of things. So it, I, I think to the, expect, uh, to, the view, uh, to, to the extent that it's viewed as a technical problem or a s social inability to access information technology, it's, it's not nearly the problem that it used to be, and I believe it's soluble without extraordinary measures. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting for this discussion along those lines was, uh, while you may solve it one way by having people with smartphones, in some cases for some wearable devices or for other things, you might need wireless. And so it doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be wireless everywhere across all parts of, of the U.S. in terms of infrastructure. So it's another thing to consider. So I know we saw Pearl and then David. Um, I would also just add um, health access disparity in that I think the role of the provider needs to be elevated in the discussion. Um, and I think also uh, even someone who's in a provider-rich community who may use three or four different types of providers, it's how much onus is on the participant for the, you know, providing the information. David? Then. Just to sort of build off what Pearl just said, I mean, in addition to sort of geographic disparities, I think a lot of the disparities that we see have to do with where major academic medical research centers are. and. You know, you can be in Massachusetts and, and, you know, if you're on the other side of Massachusetts, you, you may not see any of that. So, I mean, I think thinking about populations that aren't excellent. <laughs> okay, we're going to go Irwin and then we'll go to the back. Yeah, I wanted to uh, come back to something that Rick Lifton also mentioned this morning and that touches on a number of comments that uh, have been made in the conversation now uh, about academic medical center versus the rest. And uh, so just some experience in the context of another NHGRI network other than eMERGE, the IGNITE network, we've all, and a number of sites and our good colleagues from Duke and others are in there in Vanderbilt, we've all asked to bring to the fold uh, primary care type network that are not uh, academic. And so in New York, we had the fortune to reach out to a place that, or an institution that's called Institute for Family Health, which is a federally qualified network of community health centers, largely caring for underserved populations in New York. And um, so we, at this point, are actually beyond uh, of our duties to uh, uh, work on the IGNITE project, biobanking uh, throughout uh, community health centers in the city of New York, and I can report that uh, overall, in that institution at least, there's a sense of empowerment that they have access now to an effort uh, that uh, they so far had thought they would never gain access to. So I think those are some encouraging experiences and um, I just wanted to share this with the group. Oh, that's interesting. All the way in the back and then we'll work our way up. Yeah, Doug. So um, I, I love this notion of making sure that we focus on some of the disparities, but I think one of the things is not going to be technology or access. All of those are going to be important. I think a lot of it's going to be trust. Um, there have been um, misdeeds done in the past that I think need to be sort of overcome as we try to engage those other, um, other uh, groups. Okay, Karen and then Terry. Yeah, a couple of thoughts around um, recruitment. You know, there's a lot of activity now going on in uh, what's called the social non-medical needs space or uh, social determinants being addressed within our healthcare systems. A ton of work in Kaiser, I'm sure, and other organizations as well. So trying to uh, build on to those efforts to reach some of the populations that are often left out. And uh, most of our universities, as well as our hospitals, have community benefit functions that are required to maintain their tax-exempt status. And some of them are very robust and some less so. So if we could think about how to pull them in and give them something really meaningful and robust to engage their communities in, it might be very helpful. Good comment, Terry. 
Uh, yeah, I think we're, we hear a lot about, about concerns about disparities in access to health care or access to mobile technologies. I think something that we don't focus on as much is, is disparities in the available databases. So, so there are huge differences in the, in the amount of sequence data and variation data that's available in European ancestry people where there's a huge amount, and, and then in, in just about every other group. Uh, and, and I think that's something, you know, we're, we're finding this, and there are others in the room that can, can speak to this more eloquently than I, but we're, we're finding in the Undiagnosed Diseases Network that, you know, if you have a, a child with an undiagnosed disease who's not a European ancestry, the number of variants you have to track down is, is many, many fold what it would be in a European ancestry one. Dixie? Uh, as far as the, um, because of preferential treatment, the, the critical access hospitals in the U.S. are actually doing quite better than other hospitals in terms of EHR adoption. So when we look at how we can harvest the EHR data, EHR data, not to, not to mention the sequencing data, but, but that should actually help, help level out the disparities uh, because we will, we will have more e, uh, adopted EHRs in critical access hospitals. Okay. Always back there, yeah. So I, I know um, uh, NCI is proposed as one of the major partners in this initiative, and, I th and there's been some terrific work on health literacy, health numeracy, and the health communication branch there. So I think, I don't think anybody from that group is here specifically, but I think, uh, again, not starting from scratch, they've done a lot of good uh, groundbreak, ground, groundbreaking work in this area, so bringing them to the table. Okay, I'm going to take about two more, and then we're going to go to topic two, so right here. Uh, when it comes to the trust issues, I think what we've learned from providers and physicians also applies to our patients, which is people trust people that they see, they appreciate their colleagues. Local, regional trust is much more in place. So if you've got a national effort, getting uh, people to trust it is a little bit different than having a regional effort. So it's about, you know, a, a University of Michigan reaching out to Henry Ford, which has a completely converse racial ethnic basis, a Northwestern reaching out to the University of Chicago, and the success you're going to have about teaching that other center out how to do this work, they automatically have a, a, a patient population that's much more representative. So the local regional collaboration might be one of the most successful and expeditious ways to make it happen. Okay, last one. Any, um, David, I'm not going to skip you since you already got a comment. We'll go here. And Matt. Um, so there were some comments about the importance of being broadly representative, and I, I certainly wouldn't argue against being representative of the U.S. population as a whole, uh, but to follow on Terry's comments, I think there's certainly value in overrepresenting rare disease. Uh, I think scientifically those are some of those valuable data points you're going to get, and so there's certainly uh, value in, in including them as much as possible in the cohort. Okay, so it was, that was very important, but let's move on to the second one. So let's spend about 15 minutes. Pediatrics, I'd be curious, I, mean, I know we have people here from CHOP, for example. We also have people from Geisinger, who I know include the pediatric population, and then we have, I guess somebody may know something about child health. Alan, you want to start this? Sure, Alan Guttmacher, National of Child Health and Human Development. It may not be uh, too surprising that I think it's essential that uh, children be involved in this. Um, it may be less obvious, though, why? Uh, besides the obvious reasons, um, I think we need to recognize the fact that health is a continuum that, in fact, does not start in childhood, but starts preconceptionally, moves through pregnancy, through childhood, and then into later stages of life. And if we really are going to optimize what we get out of this, we need to include all of those stages, one would hope, in fact, in a longitudinal fashion, but at least include all those stages. But the other reason is that I think we have enough uh, data now to suggest that developmental origins of health and disease are real, but that we don't understand them very well. And this could be a wonderful um, platform uh, to really increase our level of understanding of that. But if we don't include children in this, we will have missed that possibility as well. Mark? Yep. Um, and we have moved, uh, we did not start uh, with inclusion of pediatrics in our MyCode bio repository, but uh, we have included At, Geis at Geisinger. Just at Geisinger, Geisinger, correct. Yeah. Thank Mark. you. Um, so the, I thought my voice was probably recognizable enough by now. Uh, so um, one of the interesting things about this was that um, and when we began to focus uh, pediatric recruitment in some of our pediatric specialty clinics in particular, uh, obesity and autism, uh, parents said, can we participate too? Uh, so it was an interesting recruitment thing, and I think one of the lessons that we've learned is that if you have trios or other tuple kind of data when you're looking at sequencing, that's a really powerful tool uh, that could really enhance some of the uh, discovery aspects that could be done. 
also recognizing the fact that what we recognize as familial disease uh, has a combination of both uh, environmental and genetic components. So uh, understanding environment at a family level uh, I think could be potentially quite powerful, so would strongly advocate for, uh, for an emphasis on this. Jeff? Uh, Jeff Ginsburg, Duke, following on that, I guess I would advocate in this realm for uh, as much as possible capturing families uh, in this study. It would be rather unique, I think. Um, and imagine that we had a million pedigrees, a million three-generational family histories in addition to the children that would be participating, the opportunity to actually use that for understanding the genetics of common diseases as well as uh, more rare diseases would be greatly enhanced. Hey, John White from ONC. So, um, you know, there's some tremendous resources represented here in the room. There's others out there of which I'm aware in this area. Um, you know, conveniently, Geisinger, Geisinger and um, Chop book in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I used to practice in Lancaster, Pennsylvania before I became a bureaucrat. And, you know, a, co and a colleague there um, uh, whom I valued very dearly working with was Holmes Morton, who runs the Clinic for Special Children. Um, and I, I wonder about just throwing it out there to in incorporate resources like that into uh, this effort it would be great. Thanks. Rex? So one of the issues or challenges that comes with recruiting uh, children uh, is the, the need to perhaps reassent at age 12 or reconsent at age 18. Um, I, I wonder if there are any approaches that could lessen that burden. Before we leave that, as a, will you speak to that, Sharon? Okay, Sharon, why don't you take that? Yep. Uh, so in our system, the system automatically engages the child, young adult, whatever. Um, so I, that, I think we can solve those electronically pretty easily. Um, that doesn't help with this disparities issue. And then to just build on the last two comments, um, I, I think, again, I think we have to get out of our medical mindset, typical recruiting hats, um, and start to engage communities and people, because I think if we capture the imaginations of, for example, families in the family unit, whether it's grandparents for their grandchildren or children and the parents, uh, we're gonna get much more dynamic interplay than we would if we just go for individuals. So, another way to say, you're, this is a false way to frame the question. You're saying don't get out of the usual way that we, we think about recruitment. Yeah, and, and even I think about, you know, if we populated this room with a whole different set of people who do think about campaigns and outreach and yeah. that stuff, I think the discussion would be very different. Very different. I think it's a fair point. Right here. Yeah. So um, I, I would agree that um, starting earlier would be a beneficial. Um, I think we, if we want to focus on prevention, you know, we could start with a, a group of um, children at whatever age and, uh, you know, practice some of the the uh, things that we already know that about health promotion and maybe tie that to some genetic uh, linkages and see interventions that would work. But another um, in inherent benefit of two, two things. One is that kids today, like my children, uh, are savvy with their devices and they live in that world. They're very comfortable. They're not thinking about data the way I do and, and we do. And so, you know, it brings an opportunity for growing that cohort up and linking them to research. And then I think it has sort of STEM education potential. So in our studies at NIEHS where we engage our children, you know, they are very interested in science careers, especially in the underrepresented groups where we don't necessarily see uh, that, that, that they have, you know, strong ties to a research environment. So it has, you know, some additional benefits than just the research itself. Go ahead. Go, go. Didn't you have your hand up a second ago? Yeah. I think if we take a attack from private industry in terms of the, every hospital has a uh, women health center because they know women make the health decisions for the family. Yet, if we take a look at the infographic we up there, if that woman was pregnant, the one in yellow, that's the target of precision medicine, my IRB makes it very difficult for me to approach them. You almost have to apologize for recruiting women and children. If they're, and it's a culture change among the IRBs. If we can make it easier to target uh, pregnant patients, women of childbearing age, that actually enables a trust to be created with a family. And so I think there's a cultural shift for our IRBs, for the IRBs to trust us uh, as well. It's not just about what we're doing to the patient in that setting. David? Yeah, this, uh, obviously I'm wildly supportive of families and three-generation family recruitment, and, but it points out a huge disconnect that most people are familiar with between HIPAA and what individuals and families want. 
Um, by that I mean one of our adult uh, volunteers for our biobank genomic sequencing project. I bumped into him and he said, I just enrolled in my code. I'm excited about getting my genome sequenced. But I asked the recruiter how could she guarantee that my genome sequence information will be available to the benefit of my children and grandchildren. And of course, we can't automatically do that. So we're struggling with ideas to counteract HIPAA by getting a consent process for individuals to gift linkage of their electronic health record to their relatives, primarily their children and grandchildren, and gift access to their genome sequence information as part of that. Pearl. Um, as a pediatrician and an IRB person, I'm not going to respond to the IRB issue, but I think there are different regulations for kids and for pregnant women, which kind of forces the issue. But I, I think this discussion needs to be done once we know what it is. I was very sobered by Rory's comment. That's I mean, why I have, want to come back to action in a minute, so I'm glad that, you raised it. I think it's, you know, we see a success model there. They considered it. And there's a finite, very small amount of money that is going towards this. There's not a business plan that I see as to how we're going to fund anything. And while I think having, why not just have a pediatric <laughs> um, cohort? I mean, I think the families are great. I think all of this is great, but I'd hate to see the whole thing deep six over being too broad. So, so that's a fair point that you, we wouldn't, at a practical level, we wouldn't want to overburden if we didn't have the resources. But what I was struck was that most of the early comments were very positive, yes, do it, yes, do it, this is reason, family, and so forth, and yet, Rory, you were pretty clear that there was a fundamental decision in the U.K. not to um, include a, pedi a large pediatric group. I'm just curious if you could comment, maybe expand a little bit more. Well, well I, I think as a, as a general point, it's easy to say, let's do this, let's do that. Um, and, and, of course, if you can have all of it for no cost, right. That makes sense, um, but it's that, that balancing act between what you can do with the resources available. Uh, um, I, I don't know what the right answer is, but with, the, with having had some discussion with the people who are setting up the life study, um, the way in which they will recruit is so different from how we were able to recruit in the adults into UK Biobank. The kinds of things that they, they want to um, measure are so different. Um, in terms of relevance over the next 10 years. Um, and uh, there it's re you're probably much more practical to get at these family units uh, than I think it would be in, in, an, in an adult uh, study. So um, there's a danger that if you try to do everything in one study, you fail to do anything mm -hmm. as well as you m might want to do it. And so I think um, I'm not arguing against doing a pediatric study. Uh, but I, I think it may be better to um, uh, consider these quite separately, um, although complementary, because I think they might have um, different approaches. Other, this is clearly going to be an uh, interesting discussion going forward, because I think it's not clear where this will land or how it will land. Any other comments on this topic? Okay, let's, let's go on then. So the third thing we thought we would touch on is, you know, do we need, I mean, or, or how would we pursue, how would we go forward, how would we frame a discussion around the possibility of, of moving towards law or laws to sort of prevent misuse? So lots of concern, and we heard comments about misuse, but are laws needed or we, can we do it in the current set of, of the current framework that exists? What are, what are people thinking? Mark. Uh, yeah, Mark Williams Geisinger. Um, I think law is too limiting. Uh, I think that um, you should look for opportunities within uh, rulemaking, policy, uh, and that sort of thing. I mean, an example is the uh, data uh, access uh, open publication. So if you get NIH funding, you know, you're obliged to uh, deposit data that you're generating in publicly available databases. You're obliged to have open access publications. I don't think that was a result of a legislative fiat. I may be wrong about that, but I think you, within your purview of funding, said this is, we're giving you the money. These are the rules by which you operate. And I, so I think there are potential solutions that would exist uh, without, you know, it, I always think, you know, pro is the opposite of con, what's the opposite of progress. Um, 
Yes, okay, that's about the usual amount of time it takes for people to get that joke. So, uh, <laughs> so you're very average. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> So, but, but I think the, the point is, is that you want every solution available um, to, before having to go and, and try and get something, a legislative solution. Uh, and, but I think it's critically important that there has to be some consequence for, the, for potential misuse. That, that seems essential. And, and David gave an example of what, how Geisinger handles it. And he was rather cold about it. He just sort of said, we fire. Which brought, brings me back memories of 20 years ago when I first came to NIH. My first supervisor was David. And uh, he used to scare because I always think he was going to fire me if I did something <laughs> wrong. But. but I mean, that's, that is in every healthcare system in this yeah. country. That's the training that you get, and that's the slide that everybody sees. That's the standard across this country. But is it enforced for that HIPAA way? violation? Is Absolutely. So, that's, so, and, all right, a lot of hands. I'm going to go right there. Here you go. Yep. You. Yep. Um, I would definitely like to see us close the loopholes that are currently in GINA. Uh, for example, life insurance and um, long-term disability is something that, you know, if you find uh, you have a harmful mutation, you cannot qualify for those. I also think that GINA needs to be updated um, to include that companies or labs are not using that data for discriminatory practices. Um, the other thing we need to think about is the U.S. Preventative services task force, you know, how does the research quickly go back to new guidelines um, for prevention? Thank you. Before we leave, Gina, anybody want to make any other comments? I mean, we certainly had tweets and emails and so forth about, about many of you were sort of on the front line of that, Sharon. Well, <laughs> I would say um, if we wait to do something through law like Gina, <laughs> Um, it took us 12 and a half years last time. I think it'll take us 25 years this time. So, so you more align with what Mark was saying. We need to come up with We need other to come routes. up, yeah. And there's lots of other ways to do this. And especially as individuals get their hands on their own data, there's lots of other creative ways to do this. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not totally avoiding the front row, but there's a lot of that. Kathy, do you want to say something along that? I issue? do. And it's actually more in response to Mark's comment about the ability of NIH in through our funding to have enforcement mechanisms. But if we're creating a data set and yeah. information that's going to outlive a grant, we already have problems in enforcing obligations that are obligations of expectations that happen after a grant period is over. For example, clinical trial data sharing. How do we make people do something? So, and the people who are gonna potentially do something bad may not be our grantee at all. So, you know, I think there, there is some opportunities here to look carefully at what kind of simple, straightforward provision we could put into place that would have a broader reach than just our grantee community. Did you have a, on this same Yeah, theme? Just, just to follow up on the Gina question, so I totally understand that it took a long time. Could you elaborate on some ways in which there are creative solutions for that that are alternatives? i just like something tangible. So I, or others. I mean, yeah, others so, so I, I guess um, I think we need a culture that doesn't tolerate this for lots of other reasons. And so some of those are going to be the conduct of companies and their um, commitment to this culture, to fair information practice principles, to promises. They will be af absolutely have to be attached to grant monies and following those monies through the projects and seeing what happens at the end of those. Um, the other big, big, big problem, though, is as long as we have a healthcare system that's based on our employment, um, we need universal health care. That's going to be, you know, impossible. Another 50-year goal. So I, so I think we're going to still have some stumbling blocks, but I do think we can have a culture that will not tolerate this. Just like we have a culture that won't tolerate racism, and it, it still happens, um, but most of us recognize it, and I think if we can start recognizing when people are being discriminated against on the basis of their genes and make that public, then there'll be less of it. Any other comments on that thread? One more comment on that thread, then we'll go to you. Yeah, David? I think just encouraging and uh, transparency from the industries you're con concerned about. I mean, I don't think we know that much about the actual practices, genetic based practices of life insurance and long, ter long care, but, you know, knowing what they do might help, help us address what they do. Okay, yes. Another community to engage in this is uh, our uh, professional uh, and scientific journal editors. Uh, they, they go a long way in terms of. Uh, uh, making this process transparent and, and can come down with sanctions that can be fairly important if, in fact, their rules. So the World Association of Medical Editors, the big groups, so I, I would encourage bringing so, them so in. So, but early. that would be within the academic world. 
I mean, if you really think about extremes of misuse, it may take place sort of in ways slightly outside of the publishing realm. Indeed, but, but, it, but yeah. it can also intercept pretty early uh, bad, pra bad apples and yeah. bad practices. No question. I saw a bunch of other, there's, you know. I'd, I'd like to actually like to take your question and sort of turn it around a little bit. Sure. I think it's perfectly fine to ask the question what legislation is, is accessible, but I think a broader question that we need to address is what is government good at and that government should do and what are the things that government isn't so good at and shouldn't do? And so there may be, you know, legislation and regulation are one of the things that only government can do, but there may be a lot of ways to accomplish things, and we just have to, I think, have discernment about what are the things that government is good at and what are the things that others might be better at. And that may be somewhat consistent with what Sharon was pointing out. We've got to think broader culturally and so forth. Yes, Claudia. So um, on the issue, for instance, of re-identification, so one of the risks where people want um, protection is around re-identifying. I think we do have opportunities to more creatively uh, create a culture of, of not uh, necessarily, basically if you download this data set, you're promising and you're, you're sort of in, it, whether it's a Creative Commons license or some other way, to assure that there's a chain of trust that may be hard to enforce, but still creates a normative culture. Equally, if it's a consumer-facing tool, an FTC code of privacy practices, a, a code of privacy practices that's posted is FTC enforceable. So we have a lot of little tweaks we could use, um, maybe not directly on discrimination, but certainly on um, codes of practice around uses of data, what gets sold and what doesn't even in de-identified form, informing patients ahead of time of what happens, and banning re-identification for you know, de-identified sources. Yes. And to that end, I think a very good starting place is, is having very clear definitions of what we mean by misuse, because I think it's one of those cases, you know, it's like pornography. We, we recognize it when we see it, but it's very hard to define, and I think um, I, it, it, there's going to be a lot of different perceptions of that. So I think as a, a very basic starting point, it, it doesn't go without uh, saying that we need to really define it clearly. Fair point. Yes, in the back, and then Gonzalo. Yeah, Tim. So. I think a little bit, this will actually interplay with the model. Um, if you have a federated model involving the government, say VA, uh, then you hack our computer system, you risk going to jail. And uh, the same for an NIH computer system or, or something else in the, in the federal, federal arena. So I think you know, some of this may be a question of understanding the impact of existing laws. I doubt that much is actually needed there to be able to prevent misuse, but I think we have to understand the tools that are already available to us. Gonzalo? Yeah, so, you know, one comment is that, you know, there's different kinds of misuse. One misuse is, say, people use the data to support, you know, incorrect statements about racial disparities and things like that. That's actually probably almost impossible to prevent because it's like a, a free speech kind of thing. People can take any open data source and use it to make whatever argument they want. And I guess you discourage that by making it easy for people to do the right analysis and to and sponsor the kind of uh, good quality research on the data. You know, you, it'd be nice if there was a way to make sure that data that's collected here is used only for research and rather than to discriminate against the actual one million people or whatever number of people end up being part of this, you know, so that if we say, hey, this can't be used to set life insurance rates for these particular individuals. So I think that's consistent with Kerry's point yeah. is we have to define what we mean and it's probably not a bright line, it's probably a continuum. Yes, Rory? Yeah, I, th I think that this is a word we've been struggling with around misuse. You know, we, we have a project for UK Biobank, people have agreed what they're going to do, they get the data. Then they do that, and then they realize that they could do something else, which is really imaginative. Now, is that misuse, or is that actually really good use? And, um, you know, I think we were over-policing, um, and, and, and we're looking at that. And I think that it's around the spirit. Um, you know, the trouble with the law is it's kind of hard and, and, and fast, whereas you want people to be applying the spirit of what's intended by, by use. 
Um, and we've had lots of good examples of legislation that was well-meaning and incredibly damaging to research. I mean, Bob Temple at the FDA said the European Union Clinical Trial Directive was Europe's gift to America, but because it, it stopped us from doing a lot of clinical trials and allowed you guys to, to kind of muscle in on the action. Um, <laughs> so so I, I think that, that regulation can, can be a very, very blunt tool and, and have unintended adverse consequences. Okay. Any other comments on this? Okay, then we'll move on. So the last parking lot topic was run around retention, the notion being this thing might go for a couple decades, a few decades. This is all going to be, if successful, will be a long-term plan and a long-term endeavor. To do that, we will need to retain participation, both by individuals, but also potentially by major partners at the, at the health, at the provider level, for example. What should we, NIH be thinking about, because we normally don't think on that sort of time frame, to ensure retention of major partners and individual partners? So start in the back, yeah. Kevin Volt, Philadelphia VA, University of Pennsylvania. I, w I would strongly encourage trying to leverage investments that various health systems are, are making in this area and building on that, because the big advantage that, there are several advantages, but, but one of the big ones is that you'd have a much better shot at having a representative sample of people. If you think about the fact that health system turnover rates are relatively low, you know, patients do move, but not as, they don't switch health plans and doctors, sorry, health systems and doctors as often as they do health plans. Uh, and that's going to be really important because a lot of the personal health behaviors are going to be very related to people's willingness